So thank you, Jesus. God is a, God is a good God. While you're standing, turn in the Word of God, please, to the book of Deuteronomy in the first chapter. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight about something very serious, okay? Amen. <clears throat> well, we had an amazing service this morning. God uh, spoke to us, had His way in the Father's, we call it the Father's Day service. Uh, we talked to you about, the title of the message ended up being What Changed? What Changed? And uh, if you uh, have time, you weren't here to listen to it, I encourage you to listen to the Word of God. Amen. It was the Lord really anointed and really, really spoke to us today and to give Him praise and glory. Um, tonight, it's different. So I'm going to try to teach you about a, a society it's connected to the bees, and I'm going to explain to you what that means. Uh, I don't know if any of you, when Queen Elizabeth's, what do they call that celebration, the Jubilee, you know, what's going on, I, I noticed I was watching for certain, you know, world order type stuff, uh, symbols and, and things like that, and I noticed I can't remember what that particular, you know, multi-day thing that went on. But anyway, they talked about the earth. And they were focusing on the earth and, and how important it is to take care of the earth, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I noticed these, the symbol of the bee. These two people, two young people standing there dressed up as a bee. And then they're on the projection. I mean, they made the whole palace a, a projection screen. And uh, on that, they showed a picture of a bee. And I don't know how many people caught that, but that's a symbol of the New World Order. And so tonight, I'm going to get into that some, and I'm going to teach you uh, a subject that is very, very complex, okay? It's, um, it's, it's pretty wild, to be honest with you. And so we're going to see if we can explain that to you. Amen? Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, please, and I'll read to you in the text. And we have taught you the book of Deuteronomy in the past. What an, a very powerful, powerful book of the Bible. And, uh, and so in Deuteronomy chapter 1, what we have is, if you'll remember back when we taught you, we have that old nation of Israel that came out of Egypt, uh, sinned against the Lord, and did not believe in Debar, the word. And so the book of Deuteronomy, if you look at it, let's just go to chapter 1, verse 1. It starts right off with a concentration and a focus on these be the words. Okay, verse 1. These be the words which Moses spake unto all the children of Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran, Tophel, and Laban, and Hezroth, and Dizab. Uh, now, so the focus of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, the second law, or the, the giving of the law, rep repeating the giving of the law, really the focus is found in the first verse, the first few words, these be the words. The Hebrew word is debar, and it has to do with the word of God. In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that in the Word of God, the Bible says the Word is God, and that Word, who is God, became flesh, verse 14 of John 1. So Jesus is the true Word of God. He is the true Debar of God, if you will. In fact, the Jewish uh, people, when they... We're looking for the Messiah to come. They looked for him to come as the Debar or as the Word. Okay? So he is the true Word of God. But there is a counterfeit that is in the world today. And we'll talk about that in the symbol of the bee. Uh, the bee also comes from the Hebrew word Debar. So Debar, the Hebrew word, can mean the Word or the bee. And so there's a counterfeit uh, that's going on in the world it's really Satan trying to set up his own colony 
to overthrow the kingdom of God and the word of God. And it's going on today. So when we look in Deuteronomy chapter 1, then in relationship, Deuteronomy focuses trusting the word of God, obeying the word of God, the bar. And so the Lord is showing us in the first chapter why the, that generation, that first generation that came out, uh, fell in the wilderness because they did not believe him, they did not trust him. And what Moses is doing, he's going through and he's teaching them this book of Deuteronomy to that next generation. Did everybody hear me? To the next generation, encouraging them to go into the promised land, encouraging them to trust the word of God, to trust God, and that God would give them victory over every giant, over everything that they'll face if they will trust God and walk with him and believe his debar, his word. That nothing would overcome them. And he explains to that generation. Moses explains to that generation. Why the the previous generation didn't go into the promised land. It was because of their unbelief. They did not trust the word of God. Amen. And so in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. We have a reference here. Where we have the enemies of God's people. uh, Come out of the mountains. In verse 44. And the Bible says, and the Amorite which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do. And destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice or give ear unto you. So you abode in Kadesh many days according to the days that you abode there. So God is saying in in connection to them not believing in the bar, in the word of God, they experienced an attack from an enemy. And that attack from the enemy was like a horde of bees coming out like of a mountain beehive, attacking the people of God. And in the second chapter, what Moses does is he seeks to encourage that next generation by showing them verse by verse, history throughout history, how that God dispossessed the giants that were in the land. Amen. Amen. That he gave Esau a land. He dispossessed people that were in that land and gave Esau a land. And then he talks about the Moabites. And he says, I dispossessed the Moabites, the giants that were in Moab. I dispossessed them in history and gave the Moabites their land, etc., etc. And what he's doing, he's saying, he's telling Israel, Moses is telling Israel, If you look at history, God gave land to Esau and he gave land to the Moabites and he defeated giants in those lands and dispossessed those giants. And when you face giants, do not fear them because God has already historically defeated giants in the past. And if you put your confidence in God and trust his word, he will defeat the giants that you're going to face when you go into the promised land. So he's using that to encourage them, but he's telling them that there was a time when the enemy came down like bees and and, uh, came against Israel and defeated them because of their unbelief in the the word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. So, when we talk about the bee, first of all, we want to talk about Diana. And I'm not talking about the Diana here. Where is Diana? We're not talking about you. In the book of Acts, the 19th chapter, in a place called Ephesus, people would worship this so-called goddess Diana. And if you go back and you read in Acts 19... Uh, They went to the temple of Diana and they would worship her and they stood there for, what was it, two hours or so? Constantly saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they worshipped her there and uh, her temple was considered one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Now you have to realize at this point Christianity is sweeping through the pagan world and defeating a lot of that false religion and that paganism that was there. And the Apostle Paul is in Ephesus, and uh, uh, these, this false religion of Diana, etc., is going to be defeated there. And, uh, so, but they would worship her for, for hours upon hours and say, Great is 
the goddess Diana of the Ephesians, and they're at her temple. It is believed, or they said, that this grotesque image, if you will, this statue of Diana fell from heaven. And they got it, and they put it in the temple. And in that shrine where Diana was, it became a place where people would bring their money. It was like a bank vault, and they put money behind her. And they believed that Diana would protect their funds or their, their economics, or etc. And so she was a very grotesque uh, looking idol. She wasn't beautiful, you know. But really, so you'll understand, Diana is Semiramis. She was Nimrod's wife. And, and so what I'm going to be teaching you tonight goes way back in history to Mystery Babylon. When you had a leader by the name of Nimrod, and his desire was to set up a one world government under his leadership. His wife, Semiramis, was involved with that seeking to establish a religious system of worship, amen, in connection with that one world government. And they had a big old tower that's supposed to be able to reach to heaven, etc. And it was a, a, a whole system of religion that was trying to leave God out. Every false religious system uh, that would come in history sprang from Nimrod and Semiramis. And so Diana is just simply another name for Nimrod's wife, Semiramis. Uh, when we look at her, again, they worshipped her. And sometimes she would be depicted as a beautiful woman. But the particular uh, way she was depicted in Ephesus, she looked like that. She was known as the fertility goddess. So she's an ugly woman. As you can tell. She, it, I mean, it don't get more ugly than that. And so she's got all of these, you know, you can tell on the front of her, and you, I don't have to explain what that is, uh, because she's supposed to be de depicted as a fertility goddess, that she's the mother of all the gods. From her, all false religions sprang. But what I really want to point out to you tonight, in connection to this false worship, this Babylonian worship system, that's now called Diana and Ephesus, the top of her head. At the top of her head, there is a fortress that is there. So she was recognized not only as the fertility goddess, the prostitute, the harlot, if you will, the spirit, if you will, behind government. She is the spirit behind the world economic system. She is the spirit behind world government. And not only is she that, but she, again, recognized as the fertility goddess, claimed to be the goddess of, and the mother of all false gods, or all gods. But she was also recognized as a goddess of fortification. And she promised pr protection to those that followed her. And the top of her head, you'll see a fortification. Now, that fortification right there represents... Like a beehive. Now you can't see it right now. But in Alexander Heslop's book. The Two Babylons. He explains pagan religion and pagan worship. Where it all came from. Where it stemmed from. Everything that's false worship today. You can study this in this book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Heslop. Right? Y'all understanding that? And what he says about her is very interesting. He says that she is uh, the goddess of fortification and that that fort on the top of her head was like a beehive. Now, this picture doesn't show it, but release of that statue show her the same way you see her here with a bee coming out of her mouth. And so the bee coming out of her mouth is a symbol of this woman, the spirit, the harlot. And that bee then represents the word. She's supposed to have the word. She's supposed to have wisdom. She's supposed to have knowledge. All right? It's a false religious system. But again, the bee would come out of her mouth. And that fortification on the top of her head is a picture of a fort of bees uh, that would... 
uh, go to her, etc. And we'll get into that more in detail as we go through here. Amen. Now, uh, her husband Nimrod, Alexander Hislop says this about him. He says, as the sun god, he was regarded not only as the illuminator of the material world, but as the enlightener of the souls of men. So he's supposed to be the one that gives, gives men wisdom. But remember, he's a false god. He's Satan's, Satan's plan to remove God. Everybody with me here? So he's called the enlightener of the souls of men. Now, you hold on to that. And I'll just pass it on to you right now before I get to the end of this. But the Statue of Liberty is called the enlightener of men. And she came from France. It's very important. Is it possible that what she has there in her hand is like a, if you will, a cup? Is she holding up that cup? And we'll talk about the grail in a minute. Is that grail a symbol to the world that she claims to be the enlightener of the souls of men? She came from France. And maybe she claims to have the, the, the word that is supposed to enlighten the souls of men. That means that it's very well possible she is a manifestation of that. Amen. Sitting in the harbors of New York. All right. So we go through as the sun god, he was regarded not only as the illuminator of the material world, but as the enlightener of the souls of men. For he is recognized as the revealer of God, goodness and truth. It is evident from the Old Testament, not less than the New, that the proper and personal name of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Word of God, as the revealer of the heart and counsels of the Godhead. Now, to identify the Son God with the great revealer of the Godhead, while under the name of Mithra, he was exhibited in sculpture as a lion. That lion had a bee represented between his lips. The bee between the lips of the Son God was intended to point him out as the Word. For Debar, Debar, the expression which signifies Chaldea B, signifies also a word. And the position of that B in the mouth leaves no doubt as to the idea intended to be conveyed. It was intended to impress the belief that Mithra, who says Plutarch, was worshipped as the mediator in his character of o o Uranus, the enlightener was no other than that glorious one whom the evangelist John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now that's Jesus, right? In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Lord Jesus Christ ever was the revealer of the Godhead and must have been known to the patriarchs as such. For the same evangelist says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, he hath declared that he is and hath revealed him. Before the Savior came, here we go, the ancient Jews commonly spoke of Messiah or the Son of God under the name of Debar or the Word. This will appear from consideration of what is stated in the third chapter of 1 Samuel. In the first verse of that chapter it said, The Word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision that in consequence of the sin of Eli, the Lord had not for a long time revealed himself in vision to him as he did to the prophets. When the Lord had called Samuel, this vision of God of Israel was revealed, though not to Eli. For it is said in the last verse, verse 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. Although the Lord spake to Samuel, this language implies more than speech. For it is said the Lord appeared and was seen. Uh, so what Alexander Heslop is showing you is that, and he goes on, he talks about Diana and Mithra, so-called. So this is Nimrod and Samaramus. They both, to be, they both claim to be the Word of God. They, they claim to be a God in flesh. And they desire to be worshipped that way. It's a counterfeit system of religion uh, that Satan was seeking to set up. Now let's go to Psalm 18, please. And again, the symbol of Mithra was a lion with a bee in, his, bee in its mouth, the word or the bee. The symbol of Diana, his wife, again, the symbol of the bee or the word in her mouth as well. In uh, Psalm 8, 118, let's look at that, Psalm 118. And we begin there in verse 8 through 12.
Now keep, keep in mind what I'm teaching you is that she is a manifestation of that harlot of the book of Revelation chapter 17. The harlot riding on the back of the scarlet colored beast, okay? So what's happening is there's going to be a unification of world government and world religion. The spirit that's working behind that is the harlot. And the world government, of course, is the Antichrist. So we look at Psalm 118. Now, Deuteronomy 1, when it talks about the Amorites coming down and defeating Israel, it's a picture of the enemies of God's people in the end times. It's a picture of an Antichrist system, a one world government and a one world religious system that will be set up in the end of time. But remember, this goes all the way back to, to Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10 and 11. All right, Psalm 118, let's look at it, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. How many of y'all believe that? The problem is, is that Israel and many times the church people put more confidence in not the word, the true debar, or God. They put their confidence in men. It's better, to, uh, amen, to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They can pass me about, yea, they can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. Oh, there we go. You see, we see these nations then are coming together and they're like bees in a beehive. They can pass me about, yea, they can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. So now we see then the nations of the world are pictured as bees that are coming together and God is rebuking his people for putting their confidence in that system. Now let's go over to uh, Isaiah 5, please. Now here in the prophet Isaiah, we see something very interesting in relationship to the bee. We see the Lord hissing or whistling. And it is God that like, like a beekeeper whistles to bees. When he whistles to the bees, the bees respond to the whistling of the beekeeper. And God is going to show himself in Isaiah 5 to be like that beekeeper that is going to whistle for the bees in the last days. He's going to whistle when he does. He's going to use certain nations to bring judgment upon the world. So he is seen as the beekeeper that's whistling that's going to bring the bees. So let's see in Isaiah 5. Now really what, so you'll understand what put this in my spirit uh, to preach or teach you tonight was... I have recently been led of the Lord to pray a prayer in relationship, not to the church, not to any of you, uh, but to some people that I carry very deeply about. And I was led by the Lord to, to pray that he would send bees into relationships, into situations that are uh, of men, and that God would destroy those things that are going on in some people that I care very deeply about. And so I went to God in prayer and I said, Lord, would you be like that beekeeper? Would you send these, would you whistle for the bees to go into those relationships that are not of you? And would you destroy them like bees flying into that situation and break that stuff up and so that people would turn to you? And as a result of that, God put that in, this in my heart to bring it to you tonight. Amen. So in Isaiah chapter 5, now that's pretty radical, but hell's a long time. And uh, I would rather see bees, God send bees into situations that people can be saved because God's work is redemptive. All right, chapter 5, let's look in verse 25 of Isaiah the prophet. Here he is seen as a beekeeper whistling to the bees Bringing about judgment upon his own people, in fact. Amen. All right, five, and we are in 25. 
Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Amen. Still trying to save his people, still trying to get their attention, you know, uh, but at this point, they're not turning to him. So a lot of trouble is coming to him as a result of their departure from God. Verse 26, he will lift up an ensign. So who's got the power? He's got the power. He's got the tools in his hands. It's not in the hands of men. It's in the hands of God. See? So we have to be careful about taking things into our own hands that we shouldn't take into our hands. That we should trust God because he's the one, amen, that has the tools in his hand. He's going to lift up a banner. It's a rallying point. An ensign to the nations. Now, ultimately, who's the ensign that's being lifted up? It's the resurrected Jesus. He's the ensign that we rally to. But he will lift up an ensign to the nations, say the nations, from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. See, God said, I'm going to whistle at the bees, and they're going to gather together, and they're going to go to war. Amen. Judgments are coming as God begins to whistle for those bees to be brought together. And judgments fall as, uh, happen as a result of those bee bees, nations, gathering there in the end times. It happened historically. It will happen again. So he hisses, them, hisses at them like a beekeeper. They gather for judgment and it speedily, verse 27, none shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of them, their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. So now we see in connection to the bee, we see the lion. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey. And shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day, that day is a term of the day of the Lord. They shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow. And the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. So we see God here in this passage is the beekeeper that's hissing to the nations of the world to bring judgment uh, in the end times. Now. As we go into chapter 7, and we are in verse 19. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys, and in the holes of the rocks, and upon all thorns, and upon all bushes. In the same day shall, no, let me back up, I need to back up here. Um, verse, verse 17. The Lord shall bring upon thee, and upon thy people, and upon thy father's house, days that have not come. From the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Now, historically, this was fulfilled when Assyria took the ten tribes captive. But in the last days, Assyria is a type of Russia. Okay? Now, I'm not going to get into that in the details. But when you have time, read Jeremiah, uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And I'll go there later. I'm not going to give the reference now, possibly. But God talks about. Like Assyria, in the days of Assyria, he's going to use a power in the future, in the last days. And we'll get into that uh, possibly later on. But look at chapter 7 again. So we see here in verse uh, 18. It shall come to pass in that day, there it is that term again, that day, that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt. Now the fly then that he hisses for is Egypt. And then the Bible goes on and it tells us he'll hiss for the bee, and that's Assyria. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly. There's the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, 
and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. See that? And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys, in the holes of the rocks, and upon all the thorns, and upon, upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with the razor. So God is showing a future time of judgment. And he's going to bring flies. He's going to bring bees. And he's the one that's calling them uh, to do his work in the, in the last days. The time of judgment. Okay. Amen. So then we see then that Diana and Mithra then are a picture of world government, world religion. And she's the spirit that's driving that government. She's the heart on the back of a scarlet colored beast in Revelation chapter 17. But the point is. Her symbol is the symbol of the bee. And the world government symbol is the symbol of the bee. All right, so here's a picture of the bee. When you talk about the bee right now, see, a lot of this is happening. Of course, it's an antichrist system. But God is in control of it. Do you understand? God is in control of it. Basically, a world that doesn't want God, then God's going to say, okay, you want a world without me, then I'm going to give you a world without me, and I'm going to show you what a world without me is like, okay? Of course, he's going to judge the whole system, but before he comes back and judges it as the true line of the tribe of Judah, as the true word of God, he's going to let that be set up because that's what man wants. So when we talk about this speed then, and you watch for this. Watch for it when you, when you see the, the monarchy. Uh, watch for it when you look at the Vatican. Look at the symbolism because it'll be there. And again, and I asked Tim Cohen, I said, hey, Tim, did you watch that uh, celebration for Queen Elizabeth? He said, no, I didn't get a chance to do it. I said, did you see the bees there and when they were talking about the planet Earth, you know, and trying to promote uh, globalism, basically, he said, no, I didn't say, he, I, I, he didn't see that. And I said, well, I said, the bee that they had on, there's a symbol of the new world order, okay? And I, I don't know if he knew that, but he knew about what I'm going to talk about tonight, but he did not think, know about the bee being that symbol, all right? So this stuff goes way back to Nimrod and Semiramis and their desire to have a world without God. It's, it's ancient and it's, it goes a long ways back, but it's coming to us in the future. Now, so the bee that you see then, when you see it, you need to recognize that today it speaks of the new world order. Now, this book right here, Guardians of the Grail by J.R. Church, talks a little bit about the bee, okay? Tim Cohen talks about, in the Antichrist and a Cup of Tea, he talks about the bloodline of Queen Elizabeth, and the bloodline of Prince Charles. And they're connected to uh, a, a society that worshiped the bee. And I'll explain that to you in a moment, okay? So <clears throat> when you study history, you're going to find out the bee speaks of the new world order. Now, today, it's called the new re the reset. So every time you hear the term reset, it's just another term for the new world order. Okay? It's like a hive of networks, like the fortress on the head of Diana, a picture of globalism. It dates back to the past. The Amorites came out of the mountains like bees. It is a picture of the Antichrist system and global powers in the end days. Now, bring you up to speed just a little bit. Uh, there is a society called Priori Zion. And J.R. Church talks about it in the Guardians of the Grail. Tim Cohen talks about it in the Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. The Guardians of the Grail. Say with me, the Guardians of the Grail. It's called Priori Zion. Now, what Priori Zion is, is a system. It's a people. And what they teach is, and it's heresy. How many of y'all ever remember a, a movie called uh, The Last Temptation of Christ? Blasphemy. I mean blasphemy. Demonic. Satanic. Okay. The Last Temptation of Christ. Um, when they first wanted to make a movie of it, it was protested. 
And people said, no, they didn't want that movie. But with time, you know, people's morals started lapsing. And, and with time, uh, they accepted that movie, The Last Temptation of the Christ Being Made. And what that was about was uh, about a society called Priori Zion. And what is believed is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he, he died, he didn't really die. He just went to sleep. He didn't really die. He survived the cross. And uh, then after he got, after that time, then he was supposed to be married to Mary Magdalene. Okay. And at the time that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, it's believed that Jesus and Mary Magdalene fled to France, to Europe. And uh, it, is, it is taught by the Priori Zion that Jesus and Mary Magdalene gave birth to children who are the royal bloodline. Okay? Are you understanding that? And that the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene are the rulers of the Roman or the empire or the European empire. That they're descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. That's blasphemy. Okay? But if we understand the word of God, the Bible talks about an antichrist rising from the old revived Roman Empire. And when he rises from the Roman, revived Roman Empire, where he is, it's possible he can claim to be a descendant of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Okay? Are y'all understand what I just said? Later in history, around the 5th century A.D., a man by the name of Merovi. All right? And I pronounce it the Merovian. It may be Merovinian empire was a, a group of rulers in Europe that came out of France and they claimed to be the descendants of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. They claimed to be holy blood. All right? They claimed to, claimed, claimed to be royal blood. And, and so uh, uh, this particular individual, Merovi, who claimed to be a descendant of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, worshipped Diana. He worshipped her. But he also embraced Christianity, Catholicism. And he mixed Catholicism, Christianity with the pagan worship of Diana, the mystery religions, okay? And he claimed to be a descendant, direct descendant of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. It's called the Merovingian dynasty. Uh, now, what is interesting is that if you study this historically, then this is supposed to be a group of people in the last days. It is believed, he believed, and the descendants of this man believed that in the last days, people from his line, called this holy bloodline, would rise to power and rule the world. And so priori Zion simply means they promote this teaching of this holy royal bloodline that ended up in Europe and they are descendants of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. And someday they would rule the world in the end times. All right? Do you catch that? that that's really wild to me. Okay? Now, well, you might say, well, what about today? Let's go from the 5th century to now, the present. Did some time studying the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea by Tim Cohen. And he goes in and he breaks down the genealogy of Queen Elizabeth. He gives you that. And he gives you the genealogy of Prince Charles. And both of her and her son are descendants of the Merovingian European kings. And they claim to be then descendants of Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ himself. Now, what is interesting though, Priori Zion is underneath something else. And it's called the garter. The garter is in control of Priori Zion. And it wasn't too, too much long ago, probably within the last few weeks, that it was Prince Andrew, I believe it was. Is that Diana's son? You got Harry, William, William. You got Harry and William. Thank you for clearing that up. Prince, not Harry, but William participated in the, the ceremony of the garter. And he made a statement. He said, I will not participate in the ceremony of the garter if Prince Harry is allowed to come to that ceremony, you know, because there's a rift in that royal, so-called royal family. 
But the garter is over Priori Zion. So they're involved. They're linked to that. And uh, Prince uh, uh, William, of course, his dad claims to be a descendant of what the Priori Zion teach. So there's a lot that's going on here. And when you look at this, you see her, right? Queen Elizabeth. Look behind her. Amen. Now, when, when you look at the Roman Catholic at the Vatican, you will see uh, men that are dressed up, the Vatican police, if you will, they're dressed up as bees. Okay? And also, if the royal blood, the royal bodyguard here, the royal bodyguard claims to be the descendants of Knights, Knights Templar. Now, we'll get into that in just a minute. What is the Knights Templar and, and all of that? Well, let me just go there right now. They claim to be the protectors of the Holy Grail. And when you talk about the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail was supposed to be the cup that Jesus drank out of uh, in the Lord's Supper. That he drank out of that cup, and they call it the Holy Grail. It's also believed that the Holy Grail caught the blood of Jesus at the cross. And so in that grail is supposed to be holy blood. So that cup then represents a holy bloodline. And the Knights Templar, uh, they're the ones that came up with King Arthur and, and a lot of the legendary stories of King Arthur and the, the Knights of the Round Table. They were the protectors of the grail. They claimed to have the cup. But they weren't just protecting the cup. They were protecting what was supposed to be represented by the cup. And that is that bloodline, that holy bloodline uh, in Europe. Amen. That claimed to be descendants of Jesus Christ that eventually would rule the world. Well, these people right here, the Queen's bodyguard, claim to be the modern day Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar, when they would get together, they could, I mean, you know, you go back to Merovingian dynasty and, and all these things and uh, uh, this society and the Knights Templar, and they're protecting the grail and the bloodline of Merovingian, if you will, the bloodline of so-called Jesus and Mary Magdalene. When you get into all of that, there was a lot of dark magic practice that was involved with it. There was a lot of what was called esoteric wisdom. Uh, that was because of the word or the wisdom, you know, a lot of secret things that they would, and they'd be in contact with demonic spirits. And these spirits were called muses, M-U-S-E-S. -E and the Greeks called them the nine muses. Okay, so these so-called female spirits that would impart knowledge to the Knights Templar. Uh, so they're demonic spirits. And so a lot of the, the information that the Knights Templar got and uh, their desire to protect that bloodline and that, that chalice, if you will, came from demonic spirits called muses. But when you see these, uh, the bodyguard of Queen Elizabeth, it is supposed to be the offshoots of the Knights Templar. And they are the protectors of the grail, the cup, supposedly. And they are supposed to be the protectors of what the cup represents. And that's that holy bloodline. That's supposed to, to rule the world in the last days. Okay? Everybody with me here? All right. Now we see this picture then of the lion like Alexander Heslop talked about. This lion is supposed to be the word, the bar, etc. And uh, out of the mouth of that lion, Mithra, is supposed to be bees. So he's supposed to be the enlightener of the world. But Jesus Christ is the true enlightener of the world. Uh, Mithra, the symbol of Mithra was a lion uh, with a bee in its mouth. It was worshipped as a mediator before the true word came to the, uh, came. The false word was in Mithra slash Nimrod. Goes back to Babylonian mystery religion. The honey of the bees represents esoteric wisdom or satanic wisdom. Occult wisdom. The bee represents the secret world order. Uh, Diana Revelation 17, who has the bee also as a symbol of her, is the harlot that drives the world government. In Acts 19, she's worshipped, bringing economics and religion together. 
When Christianity spread through the pagan world, the false religion and government went underground like bees do sometimes until the time of the end. The holy bloodline is supposed to be the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They're supposed to come back in the, in the end times, the symbol of the bee, same symbols, and rule the world. So here's a picture of the lion with the bees coming out of its mouth. This is a picture of, of Mithra, the, the sun god, who's none other than Nimrod, of course, Mithra. And uh, holiday around December, uh, you have individuals that wear this cap that goes down to the back of their, their head with a ball on it. Uh, that is a cap that Mithra wore. So uh, the celebration of Christmas is a celebration of the sun gods, celebration of Nimrod. It's a celebration. That's why they wear that hat. It's commemorating uh, Mithra, okay? So the sun god, again. Uh, now watch. The crusaders, they went about, and look, how silly. And, and some of y'all are laughing, rightly so. They, I mean, how, come on. These are grown men. Going... Going around, grown men with a sun on their, on their chest. Right? You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I guess it's got a mustache or something. <laughs> well, I guess they were, they were interested in fashion in those days too. I don't know. <laughs> you know. But you see, and they're supposed to be the protectors of the, of the grail, you know, etc. The bloodline. And then behind them, you see them wearing, got the red cross. And the red cross then was supposed to be on the chest of Merovi, which is that Merovian dynasty, Merovian dynasty, who claimed to be the holy bloodline of Jesus Christ. And, and so he claimed to have that red cross. So when you see that red cross right there, that's not Jesus Christ. That's a symbol of what's called the holy bloodline. Now, there's a few men that wrote a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Uh, they did. Uh, but you need to know if you get that book, it's not the one by J.R. Church, The Guardians of the Grail. The men that wrote the book called Holy Blood and Holy Grail were not Christian. They were anti-Christian. But they traced the, the roots of this more, more uh, Merovingian dynasty, this called Holy, Holy Bloodline, this Grail, etc. And, and this is why I think the reference comes from here. But anyway... Uh, these crusaders are supposed to be the protectors of the grail. That bloodline, that holy bloodline they claimed and, uh, and whatnot. Well, it's just a world government system is what it was. Okay. Okay, so this grail. Now, when you uh, read about it, it's very interesting. Represents a lot of different things. It's supposed to be the cup that Jesus drank out of, I've already told you, at the time of the Lord's Supper. Also supposed to be the cup that caught the holy blood of Jesus in it. So it represents that holy bloodline of the European rulers. Okay? And uh, amen. This is supposed to be a depiction of Merovi. All right? The Merovian dynasty. Okay, there's over here laying hands on him or whatever. Uh, this particular individual claimed to be a descendant of Jesus Christ and, and the royal bloodline supposed to be in him. He uh, believed that a future leader would rise from the mirror of the bloodline to rule the world. The Knights Templar were supposed to be the keepers of the grail. That means to protect the bloodline. Uh, okay. Not only that, but they were not only the keepers of the cup, but they were also became bankers in Europe. Very, very wealthy society. Um, through history, they were dissolved and, and whatnot, but they, you know, they come back in different forms like the, the bodyguard of the queen. Uh, but anyway, they are responsible for King Arthur and the king's literature celebrates a mystical power. That will one day rule the world. Now let's go to Daniel eleven thirty seven, And again, it's not my desire today to try to teach you everything about this subject. I just want you to be aware of this society, where it's coming from. But in the book of Daniel, we see a prophecy here. 
about a worship to the God of fortresses. Daniel chapter 11. And we'll look at verse 37. Okay, so we have a, a future king that's going to come in the time of the end. I'll start in verse 35. Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And shall prosper till indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Nor the desire of women. Now that's an interesting statement. Number one again he will not regard the God of the father. That's the true God. Nor the desire of women. So it means that he could be homosexual. It also could mean that he just does not have a desire for Jesus Christ. Who is the desire of women. Uh, but then it goes on and it says, Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now remember Diana? She had that fortress on the top of her head. It's like a beehive. And the Bible would see it's going back and it's showing you this Antichrist that's coming. And this world system is going to be a worshiper of the God of fortresses. But in his estate, verse 38, shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So we see tied in and connection with the future Antichrist, uh, this system that we're talking about to you. Amen. So they, they were involved in banking, they're involved in government, and then through Semiramis or Diana, they're involved in a religious system. And that's what they're doing today. They're seeking to bring all of these about as, as bees to try to gather this uh, colony, if you will, of Satan, which is a system that's against God. And that's, they're busy right now behind the scenes, whether it be through the, the monarchy of Europe or other banking institutions Politically or religiously, that's what's going on right now, okay? So there's a lot of history in that, and they're looking in the end times to come out and with using power, supernatural power, to establish that world government. Now, we see a picture here of the Statue of Liberty, and I want to close by reading a brief account here to you uh, from J.R. Church's book, The Guardians of the Grail. Now, uh, if you're interested in this and then maybe read this, it gets pretty heavy. It talks about the, uh, the Mer Merovingian bloodline, the lie that Jesus Christ did not die and him and Mary Magdalene had children, etc. And from that becomes the, you know, the rulers, uh, kings, etc. But here's what it says about the Statue of Liberty. It's very interesting. Now, I'll start a little bit further up. I do want to say this, though, before I read this, that there is a lie that is promoted. And as a Christian, maybe this really doesn't interest you so much because you're not a part of that system, of this system. But what you do need to know is there is a lie that is promoted, and that is that the Jewish people are the ones who are behind world government. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard that or not, but that is a lie from hell. They are not the ones uh, behind the world government. And there was a, some literature that was put out. It's called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. It claims that the Jewish uh, people are behind world government. Now that, that's a lie. That might not mean much to you, but Recently, uh, in, in times past, I went into a store in Midland, and I've got a friend. He's still my friend. He's still my friend. 
And I went into that store and I was talking to him. And boy, he was giving me this information about how the Jewish people are behind the world government. And goes back to all these very strange conspiracies that they're supposed to be involved in. But I'm telling you, those protocols are a lie. Israel is not behind the world government. And at the time, I didn't have enough. I, just, I knew the Bible well enough to not be anti-Semitic. Because the Bible teaches about how dangerous to be anti-Semitic. And, and so I didn't go for it. I didn't read his material. He gave it to me. But I know better than to be anti-Semitic. And that, that's kind of the tone that, that he came across. And so this book talks about those protocols, where they came from, and how that they're alive. Okay. But anyway, going back to the priory of Sion appears to be the guardians of a holy bloodline and the holy grail. The holy bloodline being the lineage of Mary Magdalene and the holy grail being the cup from which Jesus drank the Last Supper. The holy grail, therefore, was believed to contain the holy blood or in a mystical sense, the holy bloodline from the harlot Magdalene. Now, that's the Bible doesn't say she was a harlot. We are told in Revelation 17 of a woman guiding the governments of the world. Now, that's, that is a true harlot. That's Diana. That's uh, the spirit of Diana, if you will. And I'm not talking about her, wherever she is. Man, she's like. <laughs> in her hand was seen a golden cup. Did you catch that? In the hand of that harlot was a golden cup. And may well represent, well represent what I consider to be the unholy blood and the unholy grail. Now all of this, it seems, has a French connection. The legend began with the Frankish king Merovi and continued with the French crusaders who captured Jerusalem in the 11th century. Also the Knights Templar had their headquarters in France. I do not wish to sound unpatriotic, but a century ago, the Frenchman, Auguste Bortolidi, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, built a statue and placed it in the New York Harbor. Its construction was funded in large part by the Freemasons. So the Knights Templar were not only connected to banking in Europe, but they were also connected with masonry. You see all these magnificent cathedrals all over Europe that those Knights Templar were involved in building. Okay? Now, they, seem, they try to make you think it's, it's, to, it's dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it's really dedicated to Mary Magdalene, who they claim that married Jesus and had children. Uh, anyway, all this, it seems, has a French connection. The legend began with the Frankish king, Merovi, continued with the French crusaders who captured Jerusalem in the 11th century. Also, the Knights Templar had their headquarters in France. I do not wish to sound unpatriotic, but a century ago, the Frenchman, Auguste, <coughs> Auguste <coughs> Bartholdi, built a statue, placed it in the New York Harbor. Its construction was founded in large part by the Freemasons in France and America. Now, okay, I'm gonna, I feel led to say this to you. In our bylaws, we have, we have recorded in those bylaws that you cannot be a member of this church if you are a part of a secret society. And for good reason. You know. Now, and, and why is that important? Because if somebody's a part of a secret society and they want to be a part of this church, we say, you can't do it if you're going to be a part of Freemasonry or whatever. They say, well, I'm going to take you to court then. Well, we have it in our bylaws. Okay? And that'll stand in a court of law. But there's nobody in here that's part of that, are you? Okay. <laughs> the figure stands dressed in a Roman toga. And in her hand, a golden cup like torch. Could it represent the grail? Does it symbolize the Magdalene bloodline enlightening the world? The official name is liberty enlightening the world. But doesn't that sound a bit like blasphemy? 
Jesus Christ is the light of the world, not liberty. Could the statue really be that of Mary Magdalene? The statue was renovated in 1986 through 1987 and was reopened to the public on July the 4th, 1987 with a spectacular celebration. I wonder if that is why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 87, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. All right? All right. So anyway, it's interesting here. Uh, just give you a little history, a little background. But there's a society today. And when you watch, watch the news. You look at the news and you read about William going to the, the celebration of the garter. And you understand that the garter is above priori Zion. I'll tell you what, it's really interesting to know what's going on. And then you read Tim Cohen's book, and he really gets in depth. I believe he really takes off from where he left off and shows you how that Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth are connected to that bloodline. Okay, And so they're actively involved. And it's Prince Charles, as you know, that is the one that recently started the whole reset. He started it. Okay, So it's interesting we're in those days. I pray this has been a blessing to you. Amen. But ultimately, I want to say this in closing. That the same God that defeated the Amorites, the bees coming out of the mountains against his people. You go to the second chapter of the book of Deuteronomy and you see God. He allowed his people to be, to be defeated because of their unbelief in the Debar, the word of God. But in the second chapter, in that new generation, he said, I'm going to defeat Sihon. I'll defeat him. He's the king of Heshbon. And I'll defeat Og, the king of Bashan. And Heshbon and Bashan is the territory of the Amorites, which is the territory of Syria. And Syria plays a major part in the last days. Okay? But I, don't, I won't go there because it'll take me a while to find it. But God talks about that. So we're in those days right now that uh, could see the very coming of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm bringing your attention. So when you look at these things and you see these things and you hear about the garter, celebration of the garter, you see the celebration of Queen Elizabeth, you got bees flying around, people running around like bees. You see the Vatican police and they dress like bees or you see the royal bodyguard of Queen Elizabeth and you know they claim to be the Knights Templar. Brother and sister, you're in a time right now that could be the culmination of what a man by the name of Merovi said in the 5th century A.D. That he believed that his descendants would rule the world. So I love you. God bless you. Would you stand? Amen. Father God, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor today. Because you are the true king. You are the true lion of the tribe of Judah. You will return and you will destroy all the giants. You will defeat the world system. The Antichrist and his government. And you will set up your kingdom, and you'll rule forever and ever. Lord God, let us be faithful and trust in you, trusting you as the word, taking you at your word, and not trusting men. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.